Mary Lane Stop by my way Welcome to Library Land Conversations. I'm Adam Zand, the president of Library Land Project. And these conversations have been a great way for us to learn about what's happening in the world of libraries. Thanks, Adam. Uh, I'm Greg PC, the executive director of the Library Land Project. Today's episode features Will Stringfellow, the federal depository coordinator at Vanderbilt University. I crossed paths with Will we were both students at the University of Alabama's uh, School of Library Information Studies, um, and we had a good opportunity of working on a project together. And I have not really known much about the uh, federal depository library system or practice um, until relatively recently, and I, I'm looking forward to, to learning more. Yeah, so obviously we, we usually focus on public libraries. We're branching out a little bit on here and in other travels. And, uh, and that's what brings us to today's guest. We're gonna learn about the Federal Depository, uh, the resources and how they're actually public resources, um, even if they're held in an academic library. So thanks so much for joining us, Will. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, excited to be here. Thanks indeed. It's really nice to see you again. You know, I wasn't familiar with federal depositories or, uh, until a few years ago when my, my father suggested that, should we add that to when we write about libraries? And I, I sort of dismissed it. And then uh, I, I met you, I heard more. Uh, and it, actually just the other day we were in a library uh, in Worcester, a brand new beautiful expansion, and they have their federal card catalogs still in boxes with paper. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the program, the types of materials that are collected, how it works and how the public can access it? Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting you mentioned card catalogs because we uh, over at Vanderbilt still also use a card catalog shelf list for some of our historic documents. Um, and when I say ours, it, it gets a little, uh, ours is an interesting word to use as well. So the Federal Depository Library Program uh, is essentially uh, libraries who are congressionally designated across the United States uh, to receive uh, select federal information that's published by the government publishing office. Um, and with this, there are, so there's right now 1,116 federal depository libraries across the United States. Uh, and not just the continental United States, we also have the territories, uh, Hawaii, Alaska. So, um, and what these libraries do is that they receive federal materials from the government publishing office. These materials are received free of charge, uh, but on the flip side, there are some other obligations. So for instance, these materials are actually property of the federal government. So libraries that have these materials um, can't just withdraw them. There's actually a process because they're taxpayer, uh, they're, they're belong, they belong to the federal government and taxpayers. Additionally, there's also access uh, requirements. So if you're a federal depository library, um, you actually, uh, so, and, and they go across not just academic libraries, but you have them in public libraries, tribal libraries. Um, you do have them in academic libraries, special libraries, law libraries. And so, they're, in some ways, they wind up making a library, regardless of their status, somewhat public. So one of the requirements of federal health libraries um, is that they actually have to offer free access to the depository collection to anyone in the public. And this includes, for instance, let's say a library has an, eight, an age limit and they only allow 18 and up into their library. Well, if someone 17 or 16 wants to come and utilize those federal depository materials, the library by law has to provide mitigated access. Um, and so a big part of this is, um, you know, getting free open access and it's part of the kind of democratic process. Um, and it dates all the way back to federal government information for the US, which goes all the way back to 1813. Um, although GPO um, in and of itself, um, started the day of, in, of Lincoln's inauguration. 
So um, it's something that is so important that the Federal Depository Library Program is actually written into federal law. It's Chapter 19 of Title 44, which talks about the designations and um, how it's a member of Congress actually has to designate them. And uh, it can either be a, 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 the House or senatorial designations. And so it's something that is, is really part of um, not just libraries, but the fabric of the United States. The other thing that's really important about this is that government information and federal government information is not really a topic. Um, and that's kind of a common misconception is people think of government information as politics or news. Well, the federal government is incredibly large. There's 2.8 million people who work for the federal government. These are just civilians. This does not include contractors or military. And when you start looking at all of the different topics that are, are in, in, in the kind of the national comprehensive collection of, of federal information, it's not just legislation. It's not just political sciences. You have hard sciences, you have NASA, you have things that deal with agriculture, you have things that deal with forestry. Um, and one of the things that I tell a lot of people when it comes to government information, I, I have a challenge and the challenge is not, can you bring a topic that we can find federal information? The question is, can you bring a topic that we can't? And I've been doing this for several years and no one has been able to stump me on that question yet. So um, hopefully that kind of gives a little bit of an overview uh, of how that, uh, of the Federal Depository Library Program. Yeah, that, that's awesome. I had no idea the scope and just the numbers across the country and all the services. Maybe later we'll get to uh, some of those more unusual requests. Um, so, so how did you find yourself in, in your position? What's your uh, career path been up to this point? So that's a, I, I always love that question. And the reason why I love that one is that there's a um, series, a webinar series called Help, I'm an Accidental Government Documents Library, uh, which gives a lot of the how-tos. And many of the other professionals across the country who are government documents professionals, I accidentally fell onto it. Um, so I started working at the Vanderbilt Libraries uh, back in 2011 in December. Now I started... Uh, as the reserves media coordinator. Um, and so I handled course reserves and helped manage the media collection, which included DVDs, VHSs, and microfilm media. So at the time, our uh, office was what was referred to as GIMS, G-I-M-S, or Government Information and Media Services. And so we were kind of combined with those. And um, just kind of over time, there were opportunities to learn more about government information and just being in the close proximity and due to staffing changes, I kind of fell into the position where um, I inherited um, some of the duties and just, it really was a great click for me, a, a fit. I just, it's one of those where the management of government information is very different. It's very, um, there's a lot of order in some ways. It's, I like to think of it as chaotic order. Um, so, and, and it's just something that I really embraced very much. Um, it's cause it's different than a library, than kind of your general library materials but it's still something that it just, I caught on. Uh, the materials were interesting and it was just something that um, I, I just kind of developed a passion and especially having part of the um, the ability to, if we think about kind of ALA core values and I, I, I know we talk about a lot of that in library school, um, but one of the things that really struck out to me is the democracy part and the informed citizenry. And this is something to where, uh, you know, I was able to provide a service, but I also just really understood it really clicked for me. and. Uh, and so I've, I've kind of been, um, I guess I would say I've been over kind of government information at, at Vanderbilt for about the last three and a half, four years. I, that's awesome. I mean, I, I totally understand how one can find themselves in a position that suddenly resonates. Um, the collection is obviously housed at Vanderbilt. Uh, you talked about the fact that these are public collections. Uh, what's usage like, you know, at Vanderbilt? Is it primarily uh, the academic community? Is it the public? You know, how do people come in and interface, inter interface with the collection and with you? So we, and right now, the, the last year and a half have been kind of a bit of an exception because of uh, uh, the pandemic. And so access has been a little different. Uh, but we actually serve, um, so primarily we do serve faculty and, and students uh, and assist with their research along with um, uh, you know, some of the courses as well, but I do also, or, or sorry, not just myself, but we, as, as libraries also receive a lot of 
um, inquiries from other uh, researchers. We receive some from the public, um, and likely we receive also digital access. So many of these materials can be, um, it's kind of one of the good things about the technology now, uh, is that um, a lot of materials are now becoming born digital, and many of them are also being historically digitized. So, um, and one of the really cool parts about federal information, um, and specifically federal, so none of the other uh, government entities, including local uh, cities, municipalities, states, um, these do not, uh, they, they are, we, we're only talking about federal, the federal documents are exempt from copyright. And so there's the ability to digitize a lot of these. There have been a lot of efforts to that. So some of our usage is just directly through our catalog and anyone can search for many of the, um, the online versions of materials. Uh, the, our online catalog is also useful for getting to those, those tangible physical materials. Uh, but we also get um, a, a, a lot of inquiries through kind of the ask a librarian type um, uh, uh, application and from from our chat um, and some of them are just emails uh, you know it's not uncommon to receive emails from the public or from other researchers and so it's kind of a mix of everything um, one of the things that we have seen recently is a large increase in usage of the online materials though um, so one of the things that's that we get um, as part of being a depository is you get what's called a pearl report and or pearl usage report. And what that report tells you is it gives you an idea of how many, um, it, how many and what items are being accessed through your catalog that are um, in the GPO, Government Publishing Office pearls. Uh, so uh, what happens is for a lot of the um, online um, objects and, and documents, there's a catalog record. And basically, um, the materials may be on one of GPO servers or it may be on an agency website. And what happens is a user who wants to access an item that's online will click on a pearl and it will redirect to the resource. It may redirect to either something held on the GPO server or something held on a different server. Those clicks, if a usage report is set up um, uh, correctly, produces a report of the items that you receive uh, that, that have been accessed through your catalog. Now, you don't know who's accessing them um, or how long they've used them or if they're just browsing, but you kind of get a sense of what is being looked for and what's being accessed. And one of the things that, I, that we really noticed, especially at the start of uh, this calendar year, is just a major increase of, um, I, I, we went from somewhere around, I would say, 20 requests per month to 150 requests per month. Um, so a massive increase in those. Um, Another thing that we've also seen has been a lot of increase in materials, for instance, uh, for like census materials. So a lot of things are topically related. So if you hear about the census in the news, there's usually someone doing research about that. And that's where you kind of see these increases. Are, are there, you know, you touched briefly there on, on a pattern. I can imagine that's sort of based on the calendar year. Are there typical requests for information that you're, you're like, oh, okay, another one of those. Like what, how would you bucket some of the requests that you get? Uh, yeah, so the, there are some of the typical requests. A lot, so the social sciences uh, and social science data. So census materials are usually always in high demand, um, especially when you, we get up to a decennial census. We see more of those being utilized, um, and uh, one of those is also summers. That's where we always see a huge increase because that's a time where a lot of academic institutions are doing research, and so we see a big boost in um, in kind of the census materials. Um, another area is legislation. So if there's um, a big legislative uh, battle going on in, in Congress, we'll see an increase in, in those materials. Um, another thing that's really kind of helpful to, to that gives us kind of a sense of the requests we're going to get are going to be um, kind of if there's a big um, anniversary. So for instance, like the anniversary of the 19th Amendment and the um, uh, so women's suffrage. Um, uh, and that, you know, when you had the, the 100th anniversary, uh, centennial anniversary of that, we saw an increase of requests for materials related to that. So um, big anniversaries are, are usually kind of a, a good sign of things that are going to be accessed. Um, other things that we get a lot of have been things about, for instance, um, American Native um, and American Indians. Um, and those are ongoing. Um, uh, we, we, we get a lot of requests for those materials. The Handbook of North American Indians uh, is one that is, uh, that one we cannot keep in our library. It's always getting so much use. Um, so um, 
and then every now and then we get some science data. It, it's it's really, um, but there's not as much randomness as one might think. It's, it's you, if you kind of step back and look politically at what's going on in the world, um, and that will give you a sense of, of kind of the materials that are asked for. And we do see that some of those increases when they're more popular with the public. Um, you, you mentioned pearls. I, I saw that you had a, you spoke recently on a Doi's pearls and URIs. Um, you, what are the types of topics that you like presenting on? What are the types of things you speak about? And you know, if those are things you're in a, into, please tell us more. <laughs> so <laughs> I really just like talking about everything. Now, uh, <laughs> uh, that and brewing, that's, a, a, that's of course, my, my side hobby. But um, well, when it comes pr to professionally, it, it, it's, I'm, I'm, a, I'm really interested in, in kind of anything that's related to government information, the dissemination of government information. And for instance, with pearls, DOIs, um, one of the interests for me in that is that I, I'm on a couple of working groups, uh, that uh, national working groups that are uh, Depository Library Council, working groups one of them is uh, on digital deposit once uh, one is exploring the durabilities of pearls and their alternatives and so uh, looking at digital identifiers uh, is that the one of those working groups are critical to looking at issues that are really long-term access to these materials and so pearls and digital identifiers um, are something that um, I, I gained a bit of interest in because they are so important in the government documents uh, realm, um, especially as we see an increase in born digital and more digitized historic materials, the uh, it, it falls back to this uh, situation of, well, you know, it's great if you have these materials, but if no one can find them and, accept, and, ac and access them, it's as if you don't really have them. And so um, these are things that I, I'm interested in, which have to do with the access of them. Um, I'm also a huge proponent of outreach and just the, the being an advocate for the Federal Depository Library Program. Um, I, I will point out federal information is available and can be purchased as well. So there are some aggregators. So for instance, ProQuest, Burn and Press, um, and other publishers will actually repackage and offer those a, as paid subscriptions and other access. Uh, but for me, I, I just really believe so strongly in um, the in, in kind of the Federal Depository Library Program that any topic that's related there, I get really excited about. Um, and and it, it's really an opportunity to learn more about those. I have one question related to that uh, that idea of finding things. Um, and, and if you don't know anything about it, that's cool. But, you know, I'm curious how the technology like blockchain can kind of keep track of the chain of custody for a, a piece of information. Is that something that, you, that comes up in discussions of the Federal Depository or is not there yet? Uh, we haven't had any discussions about the Federal Depositories with blockchain. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has been looking into that. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really know. But, but no, I, I have not had any discussions with anyone on, on blockchain. All right, thanks. Um, you have a, a history with media collection uh, I, you know, it might not be your day to day, but did you notice any noticeable shifts in how media consumption habits have changed? I have. <laughs> um, so uh, when I started back in 2011, uh, one of the things that we were really big on were DVDs. I mean, we continued to purchase DVDs and we still had some VHSs and we, we still have the VHS format for a handful of things. And one of the issues we found is that not everything was on DVD. Um, there were certain items, certain films and um, that, that just due to rights reasons were never put into DVDs, but a majority of the collections were DVD driven. And one of the things that we kind of saw, and especially I saw this in Mass Reserves, is that there was kind of a demand for, well, how can we get a DVD into a streaming format? Can we post this as a course reserve? And uh, one of the big issues that you run into with films in particular, it's not just copyright, it's DMCA or Digital, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which does not have fair use exemptions. It literally deals with the format, so it, it format and the rights management. So one of the issues you run into, for instance, just changing the format from a DVD to the streaming format 
becomes problematic because it can violate DMCA. Um, but there was, you know, and I, at the time you started having Netflix emerging in these other streaming services. And so, you know, you, we would have faculty asking, well, why can't we have this? Well, fast forward a few years and you, you have, um, we're starting to see a few of the, the streaming options. There's really been a high demand, uh, especially from faculty and from students and, and other users to start going towards the uh, streaming model. Um, and there's several vendors out there that do offer streaming. One of the things that gets a little more challenging for academic libraries is kind of the scope of the materials that they're looking for. So, um, you know, your popular movies were really hard to get in some of the streaming packages. You know, many times you could get things that were documentaries and they would be packaged together. And that was a really good way to access those. Um, and of course, they're still kind of broken up in use and you see things like Netflix, for instance. And in some ways, you would almost run into the situation where faculty wanted their students to have access to these materials, but we didn't have a way to make them streaming. And so we would put a DVD on reserve and the student would come in and access the DVD. And um, they was, and so some questions we would say, well, there's things on Netflix. And I always thought, well, kind of in some ways you would almost be better off and the advice I would give as well you want to have that as like a book that you're you would have your students purchase would be purchase a Netflix subscription for three months uh it would be far cheaper than that $150 textbook and they're <laughs> going to get a lot more out of it um but but really that that move to the streaming is something that's really been big we've seen a a, a reduction in the DVD purchases um we have started purchasing some Blu-rays, but a lot of those kind of come in combinations with DVDs. I will say it's a little hard to judge because of the pandemic. So access restrictions have been a little different. And so, um, but as we are getting to a, um, to I guess the, a newer normal, um, and we're starting to see more library users back in the libraries, um, I'm not sure what we will see. We may see an increase in some of those tangible DVDs. But I, I think that um, it's kind of in libraries, once you offer a service and you have a great streaming service, it's really hard to revert back. Um, on the other side of media, we still see microform media. And so you have um, microfilm and microfiche. So in government information, we still receive quite a few pieces on microfiche. Um, now it's hit or miss on that. And, and the reason why I say that is that, yes, it is great because it has, takes up far less space than all of those hearings. The downside is that the, the microfiche that we receive from uh, the government publishing office are the um, cellulose acetate, I believe. And those are the ones that are not preservation in quality. Now, uh, the silver nitrite, silver nitrate, um, those have actual silver in them. And the difference is like a few cents per sheet versus um, several dollars per sheet, a, a microfiche. And so from a preservation standpoint, the, the on the depository end, those materials are, they're not going to last as long as a book, unfortunately, for those microfiche. Um, however, a lot of the microfilm that we have in our collection, which are not received through the Federal Depository Library Program, many of those um, are higher quality um, uh, microfilm. And those, in theory, should last a couple hundred years um, in, uh, if they're stored in the right conditions. Um, and it's so labor intensive and, and not cost effective to digitize those, there's still a lot of materials that are only accessed, exist. only exist in microfilm, and especially if you're doing research in manuscripts, sometimes microfilm is the only way to get those. Wow. And, and so there's a great demand for them. That's really interesting. You know, in public libraries, obviously you see microfilm readers or microfiche readers in a corner covered with plastic, sometimes with things stacked on top of them because very rarely used, but it's it's so interesting that the government still publishes some materials uh, solely on, on micro platforms. Um, you did mention, we started that question with media consumption habits, and I wanna turn to a different kind of consumption and ask about your, your, your brewing life. Do you have anything you wanna share? <laughs> So I love brewing. I, I've been a home brewer since um, I turned 21. So, um, and so I've been brewing for about 15 years. So the math can be done for my age now. 
Um, but yeah, that, that's my passion. I, I love brewing. I uh, it's it's outside of so government information is my profession, and I really enjoy it and I really embrace it. Uh, but my my personal hobby is brewing beer, um, which. Uh, contrary to some advertisements, uh, some might think it's running around smelling hops and uh, growing beards. And yes, I do have, I, I have grown a very long beard before, uh, but most of brewing is actually industrial cleaning. And, uh, and but it's something that I really love. It really clicked for me. And I, I just, there's something really special about going from the raw ingredients, your, your malted barley, your uh, hops, your water and your yeast. And when you see, when you start with those and then you see the finished item, this, this drinkable, wonderful um, uh, uh, beverage, uh, it's just something that I just, I just truly love and enjoy. And it's not just the beer part, it's the history part, it's the equipment. Uh, it, it, and it's such a long history, uh, you, know, you know, and it's, it, it, it is just so much fun. It, it's, I think the most recent evidence uh, indicates that, that humans have been brewing for at least 8,000 years uh, <laughs> as, as archaeological discoveries uh, uncover. And it's really just, um, it's just so much fun. And, um, and it's always, I've also learned it's great in the, um, I don't want to say quid pro quos in the professional world, but it is something that, that I use as kind of a nice bonding uh, uh, in professional development is uh, talk, at least talking craft beer is wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, even for folks who, who are not beer, beer uh, folks. Like have you stuff. looked up government yep. information on, on beer? I have. Um, <laughs> yes. And there is a lot. Um, I, I, I've seen quite a bit. So beer is one of the most heavily regulated substances in the United States. And um, if you're looking at starting a brewery or if you're looking at home brewing, you have to look at federal uh, legislation. You have to look at state, county, city, and they all vary from wherever you are. And so, um, you you know, you just kind of have the basic legislative rules and laws. Uh, But then there's also stuff about trade. I mean, there's tons of information, commerce. You also get into things, for instance, like agriculture. So your barley, um, your barley and your hops. Uh, So there's all sorts of information out there. There's also, of course, the fun DEA materials and the uh, other uh, certain uh, government entities that um, have their uh, opinions and thoughts on alcohol and other drugs. And it's always kind of interesting to see some of those. Um, and uh, another fun one that I, I do like to always look up is, is cannabis. And that's always a fun one to see what the federal government says on it. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, you, you look back at hearings back from the 1970s, and it's really fascinating seeing the language. Um, well, so yes, I, but I have, and there's tons there. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm tempted as a follow-up to ask about your favorite beers and some of your favorite breweries that you might have traveled to, but this this is a library show. So how about <laughs> how about sharing some of your favorite libraries that you've visited? Yeah, so you know, I uh, I was recently down at the University of Alabama um, uh, in Tuscaloosa. I went down for graduation, and I got an opportunity to tour the Gorgas Library and um, their their government documents coordinator beautiful library um it, it's recently undergone a renovation it is just gorgeous going in there and um they have a wonderful government documents collection and uh just it, it, i walked in there and was wowed at just how beautiful the library is uh, another one is at portland state university uh, out in portland uh, oregon uh one of uh, my fellow colleagues on uh the Depository Library Council. Uh, I was able to get a tour of that um, a couple of years ago. So it would have been the, I guess the October, November before uh, in 2019. And that library is just, uh, I, so I got to go in on a Sunday and wow, um, they were packed with students and it, it's in the, in Portland is in downtown Portland, just a wonderful facility and just seeing the usage was great. And one of the things that really kind of jumped out at me uh, is that I, I believe this Dark Horse um, a Comics or Dark Horse Publishing um, is out of that area. And so they had a whole collection and wall of Dark Horse publications. And I and they, they also have a great government documents collection as well. So, uh, but just absolutely wonderful um, to see. And uh there is one that I'm looking forward to visiting that's in my home state of, of Tennessee, um, and it's the Tennessee State, Li- Tennessee state Libraries and Archives, TSLA. Um, and they actually recently um, 
uh, they've got a one of the um, robotic uh, systems for uh, and they, they move their, their location. And I'm and I've, I've so I've seen I've done a virtual tour of that space is absolutely gorgeous. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to going in and seeing that one in, in person as well. Um, but I will say that's kind of been I, I've missed a little bit with the um, with the over the past year and a half or so is just not being able to go into as many spaces. Oh, tell us about it. We were going sometimes to six, eight, ten libraries every week, and so this has been. But we're we're, we're kind of getting back to it. We've we've had a chance to visit recently, and it's been a lot of fun. Um, well, this has been it's been terrific to, to catch up with you and, and to hear from you. Is there anything else you'd like to share? And, and how can people find you if they want to if they want to find you? Yeah. I'm sure some will. <laughs> so uh, you know, uh, I, I say I'm just I'm an advocate for the Federal Depository Library Program. I'm, I and I, you know, I would encourage anyone that that wants to visit, you know, find the nearest Federal Depository Library near you. Go see what they have. Um, you know, you might find something that um, may be of your interest, no matter what the topic is, and, and get out to those libraries. And, and yeah, if anyone wants to reach out to me, um, I'm available by email. Uh, and um, so if, if my if, if it's to access our government documents collection, I can be reached at, at will.stringfellow at vanderbilt.edu. Uh, or you can reach me by my, um, uh, if it's outside of the, uh, the professional world, um, I can also be reached on my personal at will.stringfellow at gmail.com. And if you want to, if you want to discuss craft brewing or, or, uh, or government information or really any of the library topics, I, I, uh, I do really embrace uh, the, the library culture and I, I do like talking about many of those aspects. I, I could probably talk half a day on any of those, so. but reach out to me. Yeah, yeah. A- absolutely. Uh, you know, I think it's really important to, to build this, these, uh, you know, I look at the libraries as one huge community, no matter what library you're in. And that's whether you're a user or whether you're, you're one of those many professionals. And we all build this together. And I, you know, I just really embrace and love it. And I, I really enjoy talking to anyone uh, that, that wants to, to, to talk about it. Uh, you'll reach out to me and, and uh, I'm happy, happy to talk any of those topics. <laughs> that's awesome. How, how do people find their local federal depository? So uh, there, the best way to do that would be to um, go to the GPO website. Um, it, it's gpo.gov, and um, there is a uh, there's actually a federal depository library directory. Um, if you click on the link to go to that federal depository library directory, now if I recall, the website says something close to find a depository or. Uh, Depository near, of course, if someone just searches federal depository libraries in, in, in a search engine, they'll probably find as well. Um, it'll bring up the directory. Uh, the directory is able to be searched in a couple of different ways. Um, one of which is there's just a map on there of the of the United States and, and users can click on their state and it'll show all of the depositories in their state. Um, or there's also a search function as well. So if they, if, if a user wants to try to do a, a more advanced search, they can search by location um, and, and look them up that way. And, and that will show any and all of the libraries, the current federal repository libraries uh, across the country. Thanks so much. This has been awesome, real education and uh, absolute pleasure talking to you. Thanks for joining us today. Well, totally. For having me. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, friends, uh, we have more library land conversations in store. And we'll be back soon. If you have comments or questions or suggestions for guests, drop us a line at info at librarylandproject.org. You can find episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And until next time, we'll see you in library land. (laughs) 